everybody. Welcome to the first episode of the Future Fossils podcast. Uh, this is co-host Michael Garfield. And I am Evan Snyder, and uh, we are here today to talk about the idea behind our show moving forward, uh, which is the future fossil. And uh, speaking of future fossils, happy birthday, Michael Garfield. I hear it's your solar return today. Indeed, sir. Friday, January 8th, 2016, start date, my 32nd birthday. So, um, <laughs> this is quite a present to, to finally launch the first podcast that I actually get to be on the uh, the giving end for. This has been a long time in coming, uh, even after we announced that we were going to do it. So this is a treat. And yeah. uh, I, I just want to say, you know, start off by, by means of framing this, that for me, I know, Evan, I know that you have a very different view on this. He sent me <laughs> extensive show notes for this about all sorts of amazing things with, like, like uh, 15 different links it's uh, it's gonna uh, it's homework i'm gonna spend all weekend looking this stuff up but, uh, <laughs> that was the idea no <laughs> for your birthday for me, homework. you know I'm, I'm kind of coming at this more uh, more spontaneously i you know i am a paleontologist by training and i spend a lot of time thinking about uh the remains that we leave as a species we're, we're living in a time the the recently named stratigraphic period a geological period in Earth's history called the Anthropocene, which is the human age. And yeah. what this means for us to name this is that we have moved into a period where we acknowledge that human beings are a force of geology on this planet, that we are Definitely. something that the planet is doing, and that we're leaving, consequently, a, a, a mark on this world, whether that's through the uh, radioactive isotopes of our nuclear testing or through the you know the miles and miles of concrete that we're paving over things you know the 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 uh, carbon dioxide ratios that are getting frozen into polar ice caps and right. all these all these little ways that for thousands or millions of years from now there will be a record of human beings on this planet as you know something that was here no matter what happens to us, you know, the future of the species, you know, we, we are an action of geology, you know, where the mineral realm come to life and, you know, speaking to itself. So I think that this acknowledgement, uh, this, this point of view has a, a kind of moral injunction. It makes demands on us to see things this way. And the demand is that we start thinking about and taking responsibility for the effect that we're going to have on the distant generations of the future and the life that comes after us, whether that's human or not. So, you know, that's, for me, there's something kind of beautiful also about making, you know, uh, the best possible recordings that we can of the conversations we have about this subject because these recordings are themselves a kind of fossil and it'll be interesting to see what kind of life they take on uh, in their own right, in the same way that, uh, you know, for example, a fossil dinosaur kind of takes on a second life when it's discovered and mounted in a museum and people are able to establish a relationship with this creature. Right. So, so you are the museum goers, listeners, and we are the dinosaur. <laughs> yeah, I got, we're, we're all dinosaurs in one way or another as well, and museum goers. But for all you out there that are listening to this, at, at one point or another, feel free to send in your suggestions for ideas or topics that relate in any way to what we're talking about. You know, when I was a kid, for example, uh, my grandpa would send my brothers and I all birthday presents for each one of our birthdays. So, say, for example, for my older brother's uh, birthday my younger brother and I would also get presents. So it kind of neutralized, but also like, I guess more aptly unified the idea of like a shared spiral or solar return. <laughs> so, uh, you know, your birthday right now is, is my birthday with respect to, to January 8th last year. I, I was reflecting on this, looking at uh, a, a picture book in a cafe here in Austin, Texas on the, the work of the bizarre Dutch uh, kind of pre-proto-visionary painter Hieronymus Bosch yeah, and it you know it noted in his biography in that book the the also all too familiar C next to the date of his birth like they don't really know whether he was born in that year or not because proper records were not kept 
right. uh, at that time, and, and it reflects uh, really the the level of resolution with which we were even considering time. You know, that people at that time, you know, we didn't have synchronized clocks. You know, the the whole notion of the pendulum and and you know measuring things down to the second. You know, clocks at the time were were off by about half an hour a day every day, and so every city had its own time. Yeah. You know, and so you don't really, you know, my birth certificate says I was born at 11:04 p.m., but now, you know, I think people can measure it down to the second because somebody's filming the birth on their, you know, their Google Glass or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And you know, and, and uh, you know, in that sense. There's a, there's a granularity here that I think can be explored if we take it down a step and actually suggest that, you know, we remind ourselves that we're made out of these these uh, particles that are kind of bubbling out of the froth of quantum interactions, kind of uh, buzzing into reality out of the collision of virtual particles. And so really in every instant, every bit of us is constantly dissolved and reformed at a uh, you know a level below the threshold of our perception, and so every moment is this is this uh, opportunity for renewal and regeneration and reevaluation of our lives. And the only thing that's kind of keeping us in the pattern of being you know keep this this momentum of of what has come before, but like we really have. Uh, I think the the more we meditate upon the idea that we're basically constantly destroyed and recreated spontaneously through no effort of our own, the more we can appreciate that every moment has uh, the potential, at least, to be a, a kind of rebirth and that, uh, you know, there's a, that every, every day is the beginning of a new year and that these cycles that we share and that we identify culturally as, as relevant cycles um, you know, there, there's some, there's some flex in there. You know, we can, we can, uh, mark every moment as the first moment of the universe in some respect. Yeah. Um, and speaking of which, if your birthday, and you said around 11 PM, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, was indeed at that time on January 8th, uh, back in, would it be 1984? Same yes, as sir. me. Uh, that it is not actually technically your birthday yet. If we are going strictly by the Gregorian calendar and new sort of uh, Greenwich Mean Time system, um, I was preemptive in saying happy birthday. And I think the rest of us here in Radio Land can and Podcast Land can agree that uh, uh, your time has not quite arrived yet, my friend. But uh, <laughs> this is certainly the time for meditation and reflection and uh, shared co creation. So I'm glad to share that with you. And. Uh, to uh, everybody else back uh, listening in, um, I'm looking at a, a bunch of fossils that I actually put right in front of the uh, IMAX screen here, uh, just to re reflect on myself. Um, and I'll post photos if there's a demand for that, but so I got uh, from left to right some broken pottery from uh, Hopi uh, uh, origin that uh, still has ink markings and designs actually on the pieces of ceramic and uh, then a extinct species of snail that has actually been fossilized uh, in a crystal of uh, chalcedony, so it's a transparent orange. Um, and then a, uh, let's see, petrified wood, or uh, basically a fossilized tree, which is uh, fossilized in almost pure agate form, so it's a very uh, transparent quartz with a coloration of green. Then a trilobite, which uh, is my first one I, I ever picked up that I was waiting for for a long time because I wanted to catch a trilobite, which uh, for anybody knows uh, or, or doesn't, uh, is a relative of the modern horseshoe crab, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about sometime soon as the example of a living fossil. And uh, Michael, you know what I'm talking about there. Yes, sir. Um, but I wanted to catch this uh, trilobite because it uh, is in uh, action pose. <laughs> it's kind of bending over this rock, and you can see it as it's basically moving over this particular uh, uh, ridge at about a 90 or uh, 100 degree angle. And then a fossilized, uh, let's see, what would this one be? A, a sea urchin, actually, a tiny sea urchin. So I can see the little legs and feet at the bottom of it. Um, and then a uh, relative of uh, what we uh, look at now as a nautilus. 
um, an agate, which inside has a, a bubble of water that's quite sizable. It's uh, an anhydro agate, so it has a bit of water inside, and uh, it's a good enough quantity so that when you shake it, it gloshes about a little bit. And, and Michael, I think I might have shown you one of these specimens actually at a festival uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I can't quite recall, but uh, if I haven't yet, I, I'd need to send you one, because they're really cool. Um, yeah. The water inside uh, is so old, I'm afraid to break it, because I feel like I might unleash some, some like, you know, Andromeda strain shit. Uh, and <laughs> for anybody listening, I, I probably will swear. Fossil plague. Yeah. Uh, mind my language. I uh, apologize ahead of time. I, I tend to be a bit blunt when it comes to uh, saying whatever's on my mind. So well, the very last fossil, though, is a uh, clamshell that was fossilized into multiple materials, including a uh, crystallized calcite that emerged out of the uh, flesh of the clam. Uh, the shell itself is fossilized as the shell, but if you look inside, there's these transparent yellow crystals that were once uh, bio-materials, so that's my uh, own reflection material at uh, the time of your, your near birthday. Huh. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I, uh, as far as my compliment to this, I am holding in my hand a, a seven-pound point of smoky quartz, uh, and then right in front of that, the most, one of the most beautiful and delicate and complicated crystals I have ever seen, my 2012 MacBook Pro, <laughs> which is every bit a an epiphenomenon of the mineral processes of our world as they come awake as human beings. And, yeah. and, and I think, you know, in the sense that, uh, you know, visionary artist Android Jones, who's somebody that I, I hope to have on the podcast here soon, Definitely. you know, describes himself as an electro-mineralist artist. You know, he lists this as a school of art uh, in the way that surrealism or fantastic realism is a school, which I think is beautiful because of its emphasis on the materiality of the artist and the materiality of the artist's media that, you know, we are made of these elemental forces and we represent, or we don't represent, uh, we, we are literally the quickening of these material forces as they organize themselves into complex patterns in order to disseminate energy and information through the cosmos in the most efficient pattern. So like, co you know, contrary to, you know, possibly some people's personal experience of life, life is actually, you know, like the best possible flow, flow path of the river of of uh, destiny down the mountain of all possible worlds. And, uh, you know, you and I, listeners and co-hosts, we represent that. So while we're on the, the subject of invoking particular specimens, particular fossils to uh, kind of uh, bring in this inaugural conversation, uh, I want to talk about the fighting dinosaurs. This is a specific fossil that I, I, I'm totally in love with and probably will have tattooed on me someday. It was discovered in Mongolia, in, uh, outside of Ulaanbaatar in the 1980s by a Russian expedition back when the, uh, the Cold War was still going on and American paleontologists couldn't get into Soviet countries or, or uh, communist countries to do research. So this Russian team goes into what is now considered a, uh, this is a term we ought to, we got at least one vocabulary word per podcast. This one's a good one to start with. Uh, it's a Lagerstatte. It's a German word. I think I'm saying it right. A lag, Lagerstatte. Um, correct us, please. Uh, that means it's a, an unusually excellent deposit of fossil materials. It's, it's a place where things are preserved exquisitely, like you know, unimaginably well. And there are a few of these through the world, and one of them is in Mongolia. And in, and in this place, uh, sandstorms buried these dinosaurs before they had a chance to rot, and ri very rapidly. Um, so there are, there's an instance, uh, there's a few instances where uh, dinosaurs have been preserved sitting on their nests, brooding their eggs, and in one particular case, the fighting dinosaurs, they're, this fossil of a velociraptor fighting a protoceratops to the death uh, when they were buried by a sandstorm is like one of the most 
beautiful and poignant and incredible things that I've ever had the opportunity to see in person. It's it's only about four feet uh, square, four feet to a side. Yeah. But these two critters that have their claws buried in each other's now invisible flesh, they're biting each other, and they're it's this incredible, you know, mortal combat. But whatever was going on for the entire lives of these animals is irrelevant to that snapshot of that one extraordinary moment. And I think that that's like, in a way, that's a really profound metaphor for what each of us have, like in, in terms of how, how we will be appraised or experienced by the future, that, you know, we're only going to leave behind so much. And there's the sense that, you know, in the same way that the last scene of the movie kind of changes the way that you walk out of the theater it kind of you know it's it, it creates a tone that leaves you with this particular experience as you walk out and back into the, your life yeah that there's this sense in which you know uh we don't you know most of the conditions of the life of hieronymus bosch are you know irrelevant to most people's appreciation of the few pe- you know the, the pieces of work that he left behind for us you know yeah. and, and so this issue of fossilization is not only about uh, it's about legacy, uh, but it's about the the way that time winnows away things and, and reduces and what we things have. and abstracts them. Yeah, and what and, we have right now, what we actually have as a uh, our current record running, and what we have yet to uncover in that record that may still be substantiative and essential to our understanding of our world and ourselves. Uh, the fossil record is is somewhat omni uh, chronological. Uh, occupies all niches of time, as far as I can tell, in that uh, its utility transcends time by definition. Yeah, but but then again, you know, the fossil record is itself, uh, in a sense, kind of a living document. You know, because be, er, things are always eroding out of the ground and being metamorphized by geological forces, you know, the pressures of things. So, for example, yeah. we don't have sedimentary rock with actual physical fossils of bacteria dating more than about four billion years ago because the rock doesn't there there is no sedimentary rock older than that it's all been worked over and chewed up by the planets the 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 uh, tectonic plates you know subduction and abduction zones etc yeah yeah so you know in that sense you know that this this returns us to this issue of the urgency of the attention to which we, you know, the, the attention that we offer to the like the whatever it is that we leave behind. That if we really want it to last, we have to be aware of these larger cycles and these larger forces that are at play. Uh, for example, you know, this this for me, this podcast is very deeply and profoundly inspired, and I know I will be bringing this up time and time again by the Long Now Foundation out in in California. Yeah. and their efforts to get people to think about very long time scales by building a clock that they want uh, to last for 10,000 years Indeed. that will actually tell time over these vast time periods, you know, where the second hand is actually a day and it ticks once a day, <laughs> you know. And, and in order to build this clock, they have to find a place, and they found one in West Texas, um, they did, where yeah. they can where it's geologically stable enough that an earthquake or volcanic eruption isn't going to destroy the site of their construction. You know, so it's like a lot of this is if we are intending to build a legacy, you know, if we're if we really want to give any thought to what it is that we're leaving behind, then we have to think about, you know, the foundation upon which we're building it. And, you know, that's uh that draws us not only deeper into time, but but deeper into the this very visceral, palpable, material, physical relationship with our surroundings and the practical realities uh, within which we are embedded on a day-to-day basis, but tend to forget due to Adult Swim and girl problems and car repairs. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I would say that the the nomenclature of the foundation of the long now is is not uh, irrelevant in the conversation because the, the foundation of itself being a significant uh, implication for the purpose of the organization um, laying down a 10,000 year clock uh, 
also requires a inception point or a year year zero on that clock itself. So, as far as I know, although they've uh, managed to secure the land rights and have worked out the engineering of the device itself, which is absolutely fascinating, and I highly recommend anybody listening to uh, Google the long now and or the ten thousand year clock and scope out how this thing works because it has been uh, deeply thought through by some of the best minds, mechanical uh, engineers and uh, um, people who are experts in uh, you know, cogs for, for tiny, tiny clock uh, apparatus like watches. Uh, it is a, a work of art and genius and, and could genuinely last uh, 10,000 years. My, my only uh, qualm with the idea itself, and uh, I like the idea of having a single qualm, uh, keeping it at that instead of having qualms, <laughs> you know, in plural. <laughs> it's kind of a, a take on Scott Ackerman's uh, uh, comedy bang bang uh, segment, you know, uh, qualm uh, in the singular uh, being preferential. But like my only qualm with the idea of the 10,000 year clock is, is uh, while we may be able to uh, out-engineer uh, geology to some extent, uh, and uh, meteorology to, to another small extent, uh, human beings are somewhat of a wild card, so I would first and foremost uh, be cautionary with respect to the design of the apparatus itself with respect to human beings and their interference uh, or interface with it. Um, and as far as I can see, it's a recharging mechanism depends somewhat on uh, people, human power, uh, recharging and uh, rewinding the mechanism. So. Um, I feel that might be the uh, the weak link in the chain, uh, unfortunately. Uh, some of a misanthropic idea, which is, you know, a, a, a skeptical eye towards humanity, but um, I feel like we but could then be again, a But then again, the long now also has, you know, this question, like they're, they, they ran a series of plenary uh, presentations, and the first speaker that they had present was Neil Gaiman, the author who gave a talk on how to make a story last. Yeah, the author of years. Sandman and the author of uh, Coraline also, I believe. Right, yeah. So, you know, and one of the things that, that uh, I think is actually mentioned in Stuart Brand's book about the 10,000-year clock is about how in order to maintain this device, you, you basically have to start a religion that, uh, you, you know, in some sense, that you have to... You have to uh, create a cultural machine that will endure that in order to, so that, you know, the, the care and the concern for this idea is passed down through the generations and that there, there will be people there to wind the clock. Right. You know, that's, that's very much the case with, uh, the science fiction series that I've been totally geeking out on super hard lately, which is John C. Wright's Count to the Eschaton. Yeah. Uh, those of you familiar with Terence McKenna's work will know that the eschaton is the the uh, the transcendental object at the end of time, and that there's this sense, uh, this thread through the work of science fiction, uh, early science fiction luminary uh, Olaf Stapledon, his work uh, The Star Maker, and then also in uh, the the work of Jesuit mystical paleontologist and and like one of my patron saints Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, that uh, that all of these these complexifying forces in the universe are leading up to this this sort of uh, apotheosis at the end of time where all of the universe is, has joined into one giant consciousness. And so in, in John C. Wright's series, he, he uh, has his protagonist decode an alien monument we find orbiting another star, and the monument contains a mathematics that determines the interactions between species when they encounter one another. And that, you know, because of the vast distances required to travel in order to communicate uh, directly, you know, face to face, as it were, that there are, there are certain energy budgets involved and, you know, vast economic expenditures and, and that basically uh, the protagonist decides or discovers that by by decoding this monument, they have alerted this other race to our presence on Earth. <laughs> and now they're, the clock is ticking, you know, to 8,000 years in the future when they finally arrive, traveling at the, you know, just below light speed. I love it. That's, that's awesome. And so he has this problem, which is, how do we prove to this race 
8,000 years from now mm -hmm. that we are sophisticated enough to participate in what, you know, what amounts to basically the Galactic Federation, that we are actually exactly. a star-faring race. And so he yeah. and the other characters, uh, the, the whole drama of that series is around how to properly prepare for something that no one alive today will actually live to see. And like, how do we create a star-faring society? How do we prepare the ground for the future generations of human beings to, like, how do we steer the course of history so that there is a breaking laser in orbit that will actually receive this alien craft when it arrives? You know, and it's like, this is... Uh, Indeed, yeah. I, I think, like, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. I know it's your birthday and everything, so therefore my <laughs> interruption cost is uh, at 200% uh, or above. I, like I will sacrifice the Bitcoin for you. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, the idea of the uh, eschaton, or what uh, Terence McKenna also referred to as the strange attractor at the end of history, that idea, that's <laughs> <laughs> a highfalutin uh, title, to say the least. Uh, but I, I felt it was an interesting phraseology to utilize in the poetic sense. But the idea of the strange attractor at the end of history, in a way, uh, doesn't uh, nullify or eliminate the uh, energy we, we put into pushing our uh, species and our world and our reality forward and keeping it alive, keeping multiple systems, multiple life forms, uh, ideally all life forms, if possible, alive and thriving. Um, that is somewhat uh, assumptive on the belief that we are moving on, uh, you know, what, what Zeno would have referred to, and Zeno referring back to the uh, uh, philosopher and uh, mathematician, um, as, a, as a paradox or as time's arrow, um, that we are moving forward uh, irreversibly in time, that the, uh, the past ultimately results in the uh, consequences that uh, come out and emerge into the future and into our reality. And uh, maybe that isn't so. Maybe, maybe we're actually being reverse uh, engineered in that sense. Maybe the uh, eschaton or the strange attractor at the end of uh, whatever time is, is actually pulling us forward versus asking us to come towards it. There is a, quite a bit of evidence for retro causation or like uh, you know yeah. time negative causal influence uh, that's coming out of a number of different fields one of which is engineering and one of which is uh, psychology psychological experiments and that the the for 27 years the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab investigated stuff like this and 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 for at least some of that tenure investigated specifically the issue of retro causation and found statistically significant evidence that this is the case. Yeah. So there is that. But I also want to point out, you know, that I don't, it, it has to be said that I don't think that the, the as Terrence put it, that, you know, physics, physicists ask for us to give them one miracle, the Big Bang, the singularity at the beginning of time in order to yeah. explain everything. <laughs> and they say, give us that one miracle and we can, we can cover everything else. I was like, I think the same is, it's equally and oppositely true. Uh, uh, you know, although McKenna was such a trickster uh, that I don't know that in any of his recordings that I've ever heard that he actually ever fessed up to this. But a, a singularity at the end of time is every bit as miraculous and ridiculous, ultimately, and that these seem to be, in some sense, uh, perspectival uh, illusions that, right. that what we're dealing with here is... Uh, maybe we needed the idea of a strange attractor at the end of time to counterbalance the idea of a big bang and resolve this issue of the conservation of momentum and that what we actually have is more of a uh, like a relativistic or horizon type effect where we are looking the further back we look forward the, the farther we look uh, be, behind us quote unquote to spatialize our experience of time which is, I think, something that, and another thing we ought to call ourselves out on time and, and the way that we, we spatialize past, present, future with our language. But um, that, that these are sort of equal and opposite uh, horizons. You know, one is the, you know, because we live on a planet that rotates, you know, we talk about uh, sun, you know, rising in the east and setting in the west. And so we have this 
we have this very spatial understanding of time. So to say that that uh, the Big Bang is in one direction, you know, but but it's like the sun is not actually uh, rotating around us, right? So we may oh, actually yeah. be observing one object from two different perspectives, True. and that the end of the universe and the beginning of the universe are actually the same moment, and that uh, this calls for a a like a, a total reevaluation of this sort of bonkers optical illusion insanity that we're that time is linear or that time is even circular yeah that, well that is there's it, something beyond those those two sort of limited interpretations it's not just a, a total reevaluation it in a way is uh, just adding a dimension which is this uh, sort of ax axial projection of the path of say the sun with respect to the orbital pattern of the earth that uh the circular and elliptical nature of the Earth's uh, orbit around the sun is uh, essential in the overall equation, but uh, the trajectory and the uh, velocity of the sun as it proceeds throughout the galaxy, and indeed the galaxy's uh, uh, velocity and trajectory throughout the universe is also significant when calculating relativistic speeds and comparisons between other, especially galaxies and other like globular cluster type phenomena so um you know that that is an interesting intersection with respect to say your birthday which is that we're at the same rotational uh perspective as we were uh overall compared to january 8th of 2015 uh, but we are at a fundamentally different point in space-time in that we have uh repeatedly uh shot forward like a like a bullet and then some into uh interstellar space and we are uh, a lot farther from where we were uh so overall in the past year you've you've moved a very long uh long distance um and uh, we can pull some maybe some numbers in in the description or uh, notes for this podcast moving forward but uh you've uh, hurdled a <laughs> significant number of miles to put it mildly yeah, it's, it's something like the earth travels Several million, I think it's like six million miles a day through space. That would but make we're gonna sense, have to, yeah. I, I'm going to throw a lot of, just, I'm just warning you, Evan, I'm going to throw a lot of uh, off the cuff uh, measures and numbers and, and paraphrases out in this podcast. Guys, this is not something that we've like thoroughly discussed going in. We have somebody who's a, uh, on one end, we, you know, Evan's a very structured and uh, diligent sound engineer, and I'm a totally like maniacal musical improviser. So <laughs> well, that'll yeah, probably be, be reflected in our conversations. Yeah, um, the uh, overall like uh, orbital period of the uh, galaxy with respect to our sun uh, is 225 million years. Uh, that is the time it takes for for our sun to move all the way around the galaxy as it turns, and uh, as some of you may know out there, our Milky Way is what is referred to as a spiral galaxy, which has several arms, and we are kind of in the the outer arm of uh, one of uh, the tiny sections of our of our Milky Way, um, which is uh, fairly incredible considering that we're actually on uh, impact uh, to uh, a nearby uh, galaxy as well, uh, coming up maybe in the next few billion years. So. Um, you're, You're getting it on. <laughs> yeah, Milky Way and Andromeda. <laughs> yeah. babies. Interface that Andromeda, that's right. Uh, <laughs> so uh, w one other thing I wanted to mention, though, uh, is the uh, idea that you mentioned earlier of, of uh, fossilization and, and moving forward into the eschaton or to the strange attractor of the end of history. Um, I, I feel that idea, like uh, the, the strange attractor or the eschaton itself being somewhat of an inverse and... and uh, equal and opposite reaction to the idea of the Big Bang uh, is uh, consistent with the idea of the Big Bounce, which is that as soon as the universe reaches the end of its lifespan and, and contracts, that it in fact explodes outwards again into the next Big Bang. And it's a, merely an oscillation that we're witnessing as sort of this year zero phenomena that instead of uh, the year being uh, factually reset to zero, we're merely uh, bouncing back and forth between a zero axis on, on say, the x-axis of a graph, uh, looking at a sine wave uh, moving forward on, on that x uh, dimension. Um, th that is one explanation for the idea of a Big Bang, but, but again, for me personally, it 
feels like an incomplete uh, tactic, that, that there is something missing with respect to my intuition on, on what is happening, and uh, we may never know what that is. Yeah, we are only merely humans, after all. A yeah. friend of mine was saying last night, and I don't know that this is directly related to the issue of time, although we can try and take it there, that, uh, you know, in his experience working with the, the psychedelic medicine ayahuasca, that he became convinced that we are basically just koi in a koi pond that have no idea of the human world beyond the, the boundaries of the pond and that there is a, uh, you know, that koi have no concept of brake pads or high schools or, you know, any of these things and that it's, it's uh, essentially, you know, in the same way that we move from a, an Earth-centric to a solar-centric model of the solar system a few hundred years ago, that we may be moving from a, uh, you know, a human cognition, you know, deeply and painfully anthropocentric view of mind and life and the cosmos into one that acknowledges that uh, as a sort of universal basis for the, uh, the correlation of experience and description of mind and body as uh, the internal and external experience of what it means of being, uh, such that we are able to arrive at sort of a a, uh, a basic theory of consciousness and of anatomy yeah. as uh, as distinct perspectives on on uh, or, or rather mind and and body as distinct as distinct perspectives on consciousness, and that um, in in light of that that we may. Uh, decide that we want to go back and reclaim some of these more pre-modern uh, ancient worldviews that we have abandoned when we moved into a scientific paradigm that was not yet able to investigate these things at the level of rigor that w was required in order to observe them. Namely, that the, the vastly intricate electromagnetic patterns observable in space uh, generated by stars and planets and nebulae are actually minds of their own. And that, that the same kind of correlation that we can make between the electrical activity of the human brain and body and the experience of being human may have some transcendental correlate in these larger celestial bodies and that, in fact, we are uh, basically the... Uh, the germs living on some koi that is itself just, you know, swimming around in the pond of, of a galactic consciousness. You know, I, this is the stuff that gets me off. Sure. And, well, <laughs> and, fair point. And, and <laughs> is, is, you know, if, if we are really to like, uh, if we really are going to answer these great questions, then we're back to, we're, we're all the way back around to having to address how do we mount, uh, how do we preserve human civilization uh, long enough that we can develop the experimental methodologies required to even embark on this kind of an investigation and like communicate with gods, basically, you know, sure. is, is, I don't, I'm not so much in favor of the idea that, uh, you know, the human project is to become gods because I think that science in, a in asking more questions than it answers uh, actually bottoms out into uh, like a sacred humility and a mystery rather than this sort of uh, narcissistic, uber menschy kind of control paradigm, fetishy nonsense that is so common in the singulitarian community. No offense, listeners, I hope. But um, I think it is kind of an adult adolescent point of view. Uh, at any rate, the you know the, the, it seems like the real the real project, uh, what I see converging on the lo the the horizon of the future, is is uh, we get to a place where science and religion are basically the same thing. It's the same process of exploring the mystery of that which is greater than our ability to understand. And uh, you know, if we really want to give it a college try, we got to think about how we're going to continue to deepen and broaden our ability to pass on our profound inheritance of, of wealth, wisdom, and, and knowledge to the generations before us. You know, taking the long view, it, take a long enough view. In fact, let's start it right there. Sure. Take a long enough view, and I think that uh, you start to see where 
on the other side of the horizon, all of these lines of latitude and longitude that uh, that spider out from the pole uh, that we're standing on uh, of this, this sphere and meet on the other side of the planet, that uh, when we started to differentiate into different disciplines of human knowledge, that, uh, you know, that these things are coming back together and that there's this, this sort of uh, synthesis or return in which the, the holistic human knowledge uh, that was the, the province of alchemy and pre-modern uh, shamanism and uh, you know, other pre-modern ways of knowing is starting to uh, reintroduce itself to itself. And that, you know, as I see it, probably the, the completion of the human project and the beginning of the trans or post-human project is one in which science and, and religion are recognized as sort of as uh, equal and opposite vectors arriving at the antipodal moment uh, from the, the rational decision to divide the how and the why into uh, incommensurable domains has has been said that, that, that these two things are are qualitatively different. It's like, well, you know, um, maybe, but they certainly don't seem to be because they both they both end up leaving us in in the awe and the wonder and the mystery of oh. our smallness and ignorance. You know, the more we know, the more we know we don't know. Well, and the, so that's uh, somewhat the point, isn't it? That that uh, both religion and, and science uh, seek to uh, explain and to rationalize or quantify or uh, uh, turn into a narrative the fundamentals of our existence and our uh, overall uh, path that we all share together and, and experience as individuals. That uh, we're we're trying to get the, to the bottom of, of why we exist. And in fact, like if you if you look at the beginning of a lot of uh, scientific inquiry with respect to the uh, the funding and overall apparatus and uh, space and time uh, allocated to those who made the first uh, significant uh, scientific discoveries, inc including Isaac Newton to to a good degree, um, were from the the clergy and from from religious people of that time. Um, that religion uh, sought to explore scientifically the uh, basis for God and, and for uh, the dogma or the, uh, the stories, narrative, and uh, spirituality of uh, religion um, to push forward with, with who we are. And in fact, that, that became like so uh, dramatically the case that, that now we're facing this quandary where science seems uh, diametrically opposed to religion when in fact it was born out of the same uh, origin which I find to be highly ironic and beautiful. Um, <laughs> if only people would realize now in our time that that is indeed the case. Uh, there is a uh, nearly unsolvable uh, or, or perceivably unsolvable uh, dichotomy and separation between church and state, as it were, which I feel on the uh, constitutional level is, is benevolent and should be withheld uh, from uh, change as much as possible. Um, because bitches be tripping you know? <laughs> yeah we should have a separation of church and state that's awesome I, I don't feel like my money should say in god we trust although the idea of money is already absurd so might as well uh, impose that additional <laughs> absurdity onto the equation um i do feel well, that there is some validity it. yeah that there is some real validity to religion as there is uh, some real validity to science and uh that's where I feel like whoever you pit Bill and I against uh, on the religious uh, side, um, he will ultimately falter because it is uh, uh, pitched in a falsely dichotomous and uh, uh, sort of inversely related set of dualities that does not in fact exist. Um, and it betrays the reality of our shared situation. I have to answer the door. Uh, I'll edit this out if need be, but I'll be right back if you want to talk about that. Yeah, uh, sure. That was a great moment to, to uh, emphasize, accentuate your point with a ringing bell, I think. You know, this, on the other side of the, the fence, you know, you got people like Richard Dawkins and Bill Nye, uh, but then you have people like Francis Collins, who is the, the head of the Human Genome Project, right. and is a deeply devout uh, believer, you know, is, a, is a, absolutely a Christian for what that's worth. Although nowadays that means all sorts of uh, funky postmodern potential things, 
It doesn't, you know, there's all, all sorts of ways to interpret that. More ways than there used to be, which again seems to uh, uh, evince the relationship between the moving arrow of time, quote unquote, and the increasing complexity of of the biosphere and its uh, the the increasing diversity of cultural opportunities and options and and fashions and avenues of human expression, and uh, so in that sense, this is this is the the real critical point uh, for me, this is the, the thing that I feel is most important to bring up in this conversation, and I'm glad that it's kind of led us here, which is that in some sense, the, uh, the ability that we possess to observe and understand the past is growing uh, with every year. Now, whether this is a, a, a cosmic trend or whether this is a you know a recent and re regional trend in the landscape of time, you know I couldn't tell you, but it does seem that if you look at, for example, the ancient city of Katal Hayuk, uh, or other ancient cities, these the first cities, the cities that we regard as the first cities, had only a few thousand people in them. You know, the Katal Hayuk had fewer humans living in that community than were going to my high school. And yeah. now there are millions and millions and millions of people that are aware of and discussing these ancient places. And the amount of attention that is trained on them is so vastly more than the amount of attention that was within them at the time. You know, and there's, there's uh, this, growing, uh, uh, this growing granularity and breadth with which we're able to turn and examine the past, and so I think it's you know again when you when you look at that trend, I think that there's a kind of a Copernican view that we have to take here, which is that we're not we're not the most uh, aware of all things of this moment. That those of us living here, uh, you know, we may be standing on this you know three square feet of turf at this time, but that that uh, we're leaving all sorts of of traces of, of like the DNA that we shed from our dead skin cells and the, the digital exhaust that we create with our Google searches and Facebook browser cookies and stuff. And our shed and, hair and our excrement. <laughs> for, yeah, for the, you know, all of the space trash in orbit. I mean, there's, yeah. you can get kind of cynical about it, um, but, I, you know, everything excretes. So... Um, that we we're leaving behind so much information that we are not cap capable now of understanding, and it seems that uh, as our ability to observe patterns and make sense of them in a way that's uh, com comprehensible to human beings uh, grows, that uh, there will be more people in the future studying this moment now than are studying this moment now. Yeah, and that. That, that uh, this is, you know, I want to invoke the last major invocation that I have for today is uh, my friend the Tea Fairy, who uses this as a rhetorical line around which she organizes her entire life because she, you know, she takes it as uh, almost like a Bertrand, like the, the wager of uh, uh, Pascal's wager that no harm can come of believing that the future is watching, but amazing things can come of believing that the future is watching. Amazing things are are possible uh, when you feel a sense of responsibility, uh, even to the entertainment, or you know, but but probably more to the you know the understanding and the wisdom of future generations. And that uh, you know, in that sense, there's something about acting and living as though we are transparent to the future and that we're being watched that maybe is a holdover from my upbringing and you know it's kind of like a, an adult version of the santa claus thing like don't let the invisible watcher down you know well, maybe I'm, uh, maybe i'm projecting my own higher witness uh observer perspective you know the featureless observer that that i am that is not this body into the future, uh, or maybe it's it's some some combination of all three of those things. But uh, I feel, I, you know, yeah, I find it super useful to think about it in this way. You know, there's definitely a parallel with respect to our our perception of uh, future self, which actually 
uh, interestingly enough, comes into play with respect to uh, epigenetics and the idea that, uh, and now the uh, scientifically verifiable reality, uh, quite quite likely, that we, uh, in fact, through our daily and and uh, overall uh, lifetime experience of different stimuli and choices. Uh, in fact, actually, hand those uh, genetic traits which are adaptive uh, to those stimuli down to future offspring, and that our choices as individuals could actually have immediate uh, repercussions for our offspring overall. And I feel that is uh, akin to, to the idea of the uh, spiritual watcher or the uh, the Santa Claus, you know, seeing if you're naughty or nice, like the the idea of like a spirit. Uh, becomes somewhat uh, interchangeable with the idea of uh, thinking about yourself as a four-dimensional object uh, with respect to, to the 4D uh, dimension as uh, time. Uh, you know, we have length, width, and depth occupying the three spatial dimensions and then time occupying the, the fourth dimension. This is definitely an abstraction and uh, is not to be taken as dogma by any means or as gospel for any uh, theory of everything, but um, can describe in a way like how we view and how we interrelate to and, and uh, interface with space-time. Uh, the fourth dimension itself as a, as a time aspect of who we are as physical beings changes when we think about ourselves as basically handing down who we are on a daily uh, experiential level to the next generation. Say if we are uh, practicing uh, mindfulness and meditation versus kind of uh, getting stressed out and focusing on things which are extremely material and, and not at all like uh, rewarding to the human essence, um, our uh, offspring, our children could be dramatically different depending on that according to modern uh, epigenetic theory and understanding of heritable traits from one generation of human beings to the other. So um, maybe a good thing for reflection on your birthday. Uh, I don't know, but it, it seems to be <laughs> definitely. Don't drink too much or your kids will be messed up. Yeah, uh, or, or, you know. It's kind of like that though, yeah. Yeah, don't, don't eat poorly, don't, don't have too much uh, sugar, whatever it is. Uh, you know, your, your children could very well uh, uh, wind up with the same problems that you had. Uh, stress and I think uh, depression and other aspects of uh, human experience are, are similar. But do listen to mind-bending podcasts because you know, this uh, constant exercise of, of attention and intellect is definitely going to uh, hand itself down either culturally or genetically or epigenetically in, in uh, some useful ways. Sure. I do, I, I want to point out, uh, Evan, the, in bringing up four-dimensional space-time, though, in this call already, we have discussed time as a landscape of more than just that, that uh, one dimension. You know, we've already discussed time as a as a spherical, uh, a spherical landscape. Definitely. And it's possible that that um, that there is uh, either we can extend this metaphor and explore not just a chronological duration, um, but the sort of harmonic cycles that are present in the Mayan calendar and uh, you know in in Western and Eastern astrological systems that there is a there's a kind of a quality or uh, what the Greeks called a, ky a, a kairos, as opposed to the chronos of just the the, m the minutes passing us in one in stately fashion, one after the other, each every bit as long as the next. That there's a there's a qualitative dimension to it, or an internal uh, flavor to each moment that would provide us with the second axis, and that there may also be a uh, a depth a z-axis to time that has to do with the the amount of of attention or uh, the you know the, the the depth of our ability to actually perceive and experience time and so you know the the, the three-dimensional landscape of the spheroid object that we call earth that we understand right now as a sphere uh I, you know it seems that uh just as we kind of, most of us, moved from a, a flat Earth view to a spherical Earth view, that as we learn to integrate these uh, multi-dimensional views of, of space-time, uh, that we may find that there's, that, that Earth actually resembles sort of a, an, an ecology of 
nested hyperspheres of all different kinds of organisms having all sorts of different experiences of time. Perhaps, yeah. I mean, a very interesting uh, uh, topic of its own for an entire set of podcasts, but maybe maybe just one, depending on what we Yeah, <laughs> but maybe we've gone too far today. It's all so... highly relative. <laughs> I did want to say, though, uh, as one last point uh, on my kind of peanut gallery side of the uh, the stage here, that uh, we may feel inconsequential with respect to our size and our, our placement in the, in the cosmos, uh, you know, with uh, kind of the perception as being extremely small compared to planets and stars and especially galaxies and globular clusters, nebulae, whatever else. Um, I guess though the uh, the more recent research is that we are somewhat in between uh, the galactic universal m massive macro scale and the absolutely tiny micro uh, Planck scale of even atomic subatomic uh, particle behaviors even down to the quantum foam. So uh, the notion that we're somewhat in the middle as far as scale goes is for me deeply humbling but also but also deeply empowering that we are. Um, Interestingly enough, placed in our reality in the intermediary fulcrum point of uh, full tininess to full uh, enormousness, and uh, thus have some potential and, and some uh, ramifications and significance, but not too much. Uh, that we are not quite gods by any means, uh, according to our own definition anyway. But we are also not powerless. We are, we are not by any means also uh, particles. Uh, although we might be described that way, and we might find increasingly as time goes on that sociology is uh, interchangeable to some extent with quantum mechanics. Um, oh, dang, no. Oh, drop that one uh, for your birthday. Happy birthday again for the 15th billion time. So uh, generous. Uh, well, <laughs> that, that, that's, uh, again, another podcast uh, topic for its own time, maybe. But I, I wanted to say thank you for, for anyone listening to this uh a very uh, topographical conversation uh, on uh, <laughs> this uh, beautiful day, and uh, it will be interesting to share this with you more and uh, get your input, see where we can go as a collective. Totally. We love you guys. Thank you so much for listening to this. Stay tuned for future episodes because we have a list of about 100 people that we want on this show already, and we're only just getting started. Musicians, philosophers, scientists, random weirdos, circus freaks. It's going to be a lot of fun, and we're going to explore this, this issue of our place in the landscape of the cosmos and from as many angles as we possibly can. If you have any recommendations or suggestions or questions, uh, the, uh, our contact information is included in the show notes, and it'll be super easy to get a hold of us. We are both personable characters. And... Uh, we really appreciate you listening, and stay tuned next week. We'll have another episode for you.